joined with me today by the man, the myth, the legend, the guy that I've known, I don't know, probably for almost 20, well, almost on 20 years now, yep. Neil McCready. Welcome, Neil. How you doing, brother? Tyler, I'm good. It's always uh, good to be with you. Kind of fun to be on the other side of one of these interviews. Yeah, you know what's crazy is I was telling you before we started taping is like, you know, obviously we're on the MPW Digital Network, which is your network. And so a lot of people listen to us on there and I'm introducing you and they're like, what the hell are you introducing me? <laughs> we know who the hell Neil is. But then the other hat, you know, the other from our regular, you know, from when we started, you know, they, they, they don't know who you are. They're just like, Neil, I've heard they have heard your name, but they don't know who you are. So this is welcome. So to the to the half of the people that don't know who you are. Yeah, thanks for having me. So. There's so much going on, you know, football is supposed to be getting over with and we're supposed to, you know, move on to the stuff that's boring, but too much happened this past week um, in the world of football for us not to really talk about this. And then uh, you and I, you're my favorite media guy that I've ever talked to. So, uh, and you seem to get me in trouble sometimes and I'll, I'll just forget that I'm on camera and stuff. So this is going to be fun. And so, uh, but I got a lot of statue of limitations that have, that have ran out. So this was, this was going to be good. So, uh, we're going to start off with Arizona State um, and the NCAA. Um, and we talked about this back in the summer when this started breaking, but the big news this week is Antonio Pierce, who seemed to be kind of the, the center name and all this stuff that kind of got everything started, he finally stepped down is no longer with the program. And he's actually their fifth coach since the summer. So basically half their staff is now on the field staff has dissipated um, with all alleged violations and everything that's going on. Uh, what's your what's your gut like what do you when you see from a media standpoint and I know you you cover the Southeastern Conference for the most part but when you see a Pac-12 school and you see five coaches bolting out what's what's your first thought that goes across your mind they're going to get hit hard they're going to get hammered um, and I don't frankly having read a little bit about it when you told me hey we're going to talk about this I was like I better dig into this a little bit and I, I read some things I was like whoa they, they have no defense I mean their only defense is oops um, yeah, we did it. Uh, we fired everybody that was part of it. I don't know how Herm Edwards survives that, right? I mean, how do you, how do you have plausible deniability as a head coach when it involved that many people on your staff and it went on for as long as it did? Because at that point, I think it would be, I think it would be safe for the NCAA to say, so even if we assume for a moment that you didn't know, that's lack of institutional control for not knowing. I, I think I think they get hit hard. I don't I don't think there's any route they can go. Listen, I remember when this happened. You know, we all do. We all remember March of 2020. I was covering a new staff. You know that uh, they replaced yep. you guys, and and um, they had all these plans for that spring from a recruiting standpoint. They were going to bring all these kids to campus. They were trying to get that first year momentum going and all of that. And the pandemic hits, and uh, it's a dead period. And they had to scrap all of those plans. And then the dead period kept going and kept going and kept going. And to my knowledge, I covered a staff that kind of followed those rules. And I think generally everyone did. Because you knew that, hey, with this COVID thing, no matter what you think of it, no matter what your thoughts, how, how your thoughts grew about COVID over the time, you knew this was probably something that the NCAA was going to be sensitive to, and you just couldn't bring kids to campus. And there was a frustration, um, uh, certainly with the staff that I covered, and I'm sure with a lot of staffs that, you know, we're having to bring, we're having to recruit kids without meeting them in person. We're doing Zoom calls and we're doing FaceTime audio and we're doing all of these things, but we're, we're never meeting them. We're not getting to go into their home. We're not meeting grandmothers and aunts and people and stuff. And so it was hard to, hey, who's the decision maker? There's, there's a lot of stuff going on. But because those were the rules and they kept kicking it back, I, I believe, Tyler, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think most people generally followed the dead period rule. I, and look, am I, am I naive? Do I think there was contact? Of course there was contact. Do I think most programs brought kids to campus, worked them out, took video of the workout? And I don't. I don't think that really happened. I, I don't. And so when Arizona State did it, I think the defense of, well, everyone else was doing it, I think that's often a, a pretty viable defense 
I don't know in this case it is, and you might disagree, but I, I, I don't think many people were bringing guys to campus and doing visits during the pandemic. Yeah, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to think the greatest way I can say this without uh, anybody in a, a black suit and a, a white shirt with a black tie with sunglasses on showing up at my front door. Um, the best way to describe this is, look, I've told you this before. It's like there are rules, okay, but is it really bre- – and I'm asking you, if this from a coach's standpoint, mm-hmm. is it really breaking the rules if everyone else is doing it, okay, and it's your only way of survival, okay, or only way to do your job? So no. what I mean by this is this. So where they – it was just it was the manner in which they did it okay so what i mean by that is this during the pandemic you could technically have visitors just not in your building they could come do just like every other student they could come do a tour sure they could come to campus they could see things and do everything but they couldn't come inside the football building okay am i saying that the co that coaches on other schools may have not like they didn't like sit and wave out the window they may have you know, accidentally going and check the class inside the chemistry department and saw somebody on that tour or whatever. Okay. But they didn't arrange, they didn't buy a plane. And then where Arizona state messed up is was other people doing it. Yes. That way, but they didn't pay on your own credit card for a kid to fly from Philadelphia and then use your own personal email with a, with a paper trail, um, to come do that. It was, they just went overboard. They went a little blatant. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was stupid. They were stupid. They were, they were, they were blatant about it. And yeah, there, you know, there's rules. The rule book is hella thick, right? And, and there's so many rules. Okay. It's like this. And I've told people all the time, like there are rules and they've since been changed, but I can remember back in the day, it was against the NCAA rules at one point in time it could have been a thunderstorm outside and pouring down rain, okay? I could be driving to go get some lunch and see one of my players walking in the rain. For me to pick him up in my car and give him a ride to class would have been against the rules. And that is a violation by the letter of the law. Not anymore, but it used to be, okay? Did I break that rule? Yes. Of okay? course. And I would have, I would have a, a lot. OK, and I would have loved and my whole point was, is I would love to go and be like, I'm sorry, guys, I got fired for an NCAA violation because I picked a kid up in a storm um, and pouring rain to take him to class. Yep. I got fired for that. I mean, like, and that's the kind so- of thing that if you even told compliance, right, compliance is like, I'm not I'm not writing that up. We're not we're not de- we're not doing some that. compliance. So, yeah. Some compliance. You, know, you were at Ole Miss for a, you were at Ole Miss for a while. So well, uh, I will say this. I, I will can I, I will say this in yeah. Ole Miss's defense. Yeah. And, and they get a bad rap a lot of times, right? The compliance at, at Ole Miss gets a bad rap because of what happened in the past. One of the best, if not the best, compliance, I, I would say there in Alabama, the two best relationships I had with compliance. Um I, and I, I still think that I think Julie did a phenomenal job. I only spent a very short time with Matt Ball. Um, I've never had a problem with him at all. Great guy. Um, Julie, and here's the thing. This is why I liked him, okay? And you know this. I, I was a guy that liked to operate in the gray area, okay? I didn't I didn't want to cross the line, but I was going to take the rules, and I was going to stretch them, and I was going to make them tell me no, okay? And <clears throat> a lot of compliance staffs across the country, you would say, hey, can I do this? And they'd be like, no, but let me go check the rules and see if you can. You know, that was that's that's how compliance works 90% of the schools. Here, it was like, hey, can I do this? I don't know. Let me check. And, and they would. They would go let check, and then they would find creative ways and help me get creative on how to do things. So from that standpoint, that's all you can ask for from a sure. recruiting, you know. And if you and if you break the law and, and you get your ass busted, then you deserve it, you know. Um, but uh, I did want to say that because I know there's a lot of bad sentiment from the uh, previous investigations and stuff like that with the, with the staff here. But I, I, I liked them. I didn't have a problem with it. So just like I know I know a lot of people don't like Ross. I love Ross. Ross gave me my multi-year contract right before we got fired. I love Ross. <laughs> I send Ross Christmas. I, he texted me this morning, by the way. I freaking <laughs> love the guy. Are you kidding me? So, you know, that's just how it goes. So you know, It's funny. I like Ross, too. I always got along with Ross. I mean, even when 
even when Ross was mad at me, he went directly at me as opposed to some of the crap that I've dealt with in 14 years here where it's always behind my back and I find out later. It's the most common conversation I have with a former Ole Miss coach. They'll be like, you know, I was told not to like you. And I was told that you were bad. And then now it kind of doesn't seem like you're all that bad. I'd rather deal with a direct, hey, what you just did was Bush League. Let's talk about it than and me tell, telling him to, you know, blank off. I went, you know, I'd rather I'd rather have the conversation that way than 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 do the the four or five year no relationship and then when they when they leave they come up to you and say hey man I'm kind of sorry for the way I treated you I just was told that's how it was supposed to be I mean I've had that conversation so many times and it's so odd yeah you know what I don't think though I'm being dead serious no one ever said that to me while I was there now maybe they knew that I already knew you yeah I think, they, I think they knew there was a pre-existing relationship there it's always yeah. it's only it's only happened with people that I've never met before and it, it just it always kind of comes out and it's not a big deal listen I don't want to make this about me at all because it, it's not that's not a thing, but it's just it's always kind of an interesting dynamic when it happens. Yeah, the the thing I will say this: I think a lot of the times, I think a lot of the, you kind of get guilty by association, and the same thing with with the other that other uh, site that they used to have too. Um, that I, I don't know if it's still there. I think they've changed a couple times, but the when the whole uh, tweet went out and the whole uh, come to compliance at Ole Miss with any issues that yeah. went out. Yeah, they became like, I. This is the part of the job that I, I got. Like, I would get legitly pissed off on, is I would have to answer questions, compliance questions, about things that were on message boards because we all know that's the freaking truth, right? Absolutely. Um, and so, like, or that's the stuff that I. It took time out of my day, and I was busy doing something, sure. and they hit me with some shit I've never heard of. And I'm like, guys, uh, I mean, it's on a freaking message board, but we're taking that for like it's gospel, okay? And and I, and like to me, I'm not a message board guy, okay? But I'm not an idiot either, okay? And so I did ha always have somebody inside my recruiting department that monitored them to kind of let me know what was coming down the pipe, okay? Like example, I got hit one time with some kid that was at camp posted a picture that was on a message board that said they're probably going to tell you at some point in time about this, and I'm like great so I, I was ready for it and prepared for it but um yeah that was probably the and you probably because you own the site so that's probably where you got thrown into some of that but i don't think it was really at you but that's where that was but but um, you didn't you didn't bring kids in for official visits during a dead period and have no coaches pay for it i mean you and i we talked about this before we got started there's a there's the thing about speed limits you know right so if you're on a <laughs> you're on a, a 70 the speed limit's 70 and everybody's going 77-ish. The guy that's going 80, he might perturb you a little bit, but you're not, you're not going like, to call the police on it. Because, no. you, you know, you're kind of breaking the law, too, technically. The speed limit's 70, and you're going 77, 78. So he's going 80, and you're like, dude, chill. But that's as far as you go. But the guy comes flying by you going 160 miles an hour, you're like, that dude's going to kill somebody. And you pick up the phone, that's when you're calling star HP or whatever because you're like, hey, this guy, before he hurts somebody, y'all need to be aware this guy, mile marker 31 on I-55 is going 130 miles an hour. He's going to hurt somebody. That, that's what Arizona State was going 100 and whatever, whatever number you want to use. That They were doing that. Everybody else was, during the pandemic, especially people were sensitive to that stuff. Everybody knew that people were getting irritated but everybody knew hey look these are the rules and people were sensitive about this and we can't we don't want games to get canceled and we don't want seasons to get canceled and everybody was pretty careful about that stuff to the best of my knowledge and 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 then for them to do that that's you you made a lot of enemies and so I, I don't i don't know what choice the NCAA has frankly i'm surprised that that edwards is is surviving this i'm surprised that oh, i'm, I'm shocked. not I'm shocked that Arizona State is saying, oh, yeah, we're, 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 he's our guy. Well, here, here's – and th this is a great – I'm glad you brought that up. I'm not surprised at all. He's okay, going to be the last one – he's going to be the last one out the door. Okay. okay. Why? Because he's 67 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is it. He's getting paid millions of dollars. Okay. And, like, he – when he – when they roll him out, he's going to the beach. Okay. He, he's riding out in the sunset. So, he has nothing else to do. 
So a normal coach, if you're 40 years old, you're going to, you know, resign or whatever try to save face because you've got a secure future employment, okay? He's going to ride this bad boy out. I mean, he is going to ride it out. They're going to have to, you know, drag him out with, with feet screaming. Uh, he'll be the last one to go. But the guys like Antonio Pierce, he wants to go to the NFL. It's time for him to go. These guys are trying to, you know, secure future employment. And then with him, shoot, he's going he'll ride it out. I think he's going to ride it out. I mean, which – Surprisingly, I thought this was going to be the Bruce Pearl situation, but he just got two games. Sign me up for that shit. All right, but he just got two games for his. But these guys are going to ride it, the Will Wade deal. Ride it out. Get your 4 or $5 million until they can prove that they're going to get you out of here because in the current mode of NCAA investigations, we may be doing this for another three or four or five years. In the meantime, he's got $10 million instead of walking out the door right now yeah. with nothing. I mean, not to not – to- hijack your your podcast here it, it's why when people are like the ncaa needs to do something about nil i'm like man the ncaa can't even handle their the, the current workload you want them to handle nil <laughs> in addition to what they're doing i mean you're out of your mind i mean they, they don't have the manpower for that they even if they even, even if, if they trusted did. even if you yeah. trusted the ncaa and i don't even if you trusted the ncaa even if you believe that they were a reputable organization and i don't even if you believe that they didn't have an agenda, don't have an agenda, and I don't believe that. <laughs> Even if you believed all of those things, it would be impossible for them to navigate those waters. Impossible. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I will say this, though. Arizona State is the type of program, though, that they, if when they get their chance, they're going to just go, I mean, they're just going to drop the hammer. You know what? You might be onto something here because I keep waiting for the NCAA to at least send a warning volley out about NIL. And now that they're on the campus, might as well, right? Yeah, this might be the perfect opportunity for them to go. You know, hey, while we're here, Ole Miss says hello. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> while while we're here, we'd like to see every NIL deal you have, um, and make sure that all the paperwork is done exactly right. And then when they they'll find something because not everybody's doing NIL appropriately. I'm sure we're going to get to that at some point. Allegedly. And uh, yeah, allegedly, and <laughs> stop. <laughs> and then <laughs> once they're, they're going to bust somebody, they're going to, they're, they're absolutely going to hammer somebody. There's no doubt in my mind that the NCAA is going to at least send a warning shot out that goes, Hey, we might be, we might be paralyzed. We might be handicapped, but we still have a pulse. Yeah. I mean, it's going to happen. Uh, that's what I think too. Hey, you said something funny a little, a few, a few minutes ago, you were like, you know, when you're going 77, Okay, so when you're going 77 in the right-hand lane and the guy, some guy passes you going 80, okay, you may or may not complain about that guy going 80 about his luxury taxes, okay? And then and then the guy going 80 is like, wait a minute, the guy going 77 passed me a minute ago. You're a clown. And then, and then oh, yeah, and that guy going 150 the whole time for the last 15 years, you know, you've got to call him out too. But, hey, let's talk a little bit about this uh, – because I know you're, you're you're in it because you cover so much Ole Miss, um, and it's kind of unique. I've actually uh, have a relationship with all three of these guys, so I just I was like eat my popcorn, man. I loved every second um, of this Jimbo Lane and Nick thing last week. Yeah. Um, and I know all three guys. Okay, so I know all three guys. I think I have a different take than a lot of people um, on this. Uh, which give me give me your take, and then because I know mine's completely different. Because I don't, again, I have kind of, I know them all, so I kind of know what they're thinking most times. And uh, give me, what's your take on this whole, I guess it started, did Lane go before Nick? I think it went Lane, then Nick, and then Jimbo went the next day, right? Yeah, I, see, I think Lane intentionally went early. Now, it's possible, it's it's possible that it was just happenstance that, uh, you know, like Ole Miss wasn't signing anybody in the late period. Dude, he was trying to get to the boat. Are you kidding me? And, and, it's, and it's possible that he was just trying to get to the boat, and it worked out this way. It sure makes a better narrative if he did it intentionally. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll let you – yeah, go ahead. But regardless, I think he was just being candid. I think, yeah. you know, I think he was just being honest. Um, that is what people say about Texas A&M. If, you, if you're out in the in, – in, you talk to people in coaching circles, if you talk to people <laughs> in uh, – <laughs> I don't want so funny. If you I'm talk sorry, to people, you said, if you talk to ahead. people in agent circles, they'll all tell you this: that hey, Texas A&M has this NIL thing going. That they're 
that the amount of money that's being promised um, via NIL is is exorbitant. I mean, the number that Lane talked about was Lane hinted at twenty five million, and think, frankly, I've heard a bigger number for this class over if they all stay four years and everybody and they won't. So it's not actually going to be that amount of money. But in sliced bread, your source? Uh, it was not sliced bread. I don't. I don't know sliced bread. Um, I've we never have on the podcast. I've never been to Bro Bible. Um, I didn't know that was a website. I learned a lot on that. One. Yeah, never heard it before. And and so you know, I don't think Lane. I mean, look, Lane trolls and Lane pokes and he prods, <laughs> but I suspect that this was him just kind of being honest. I really took it more as his way of saying. Look, it's very clear that Lane Kippen thinks that there needs to be limits on NIL. He thinks yeah. that someone's going to have to legislate this or it's going to get out of control. He kept referring to it as an issue. And for Ole Miss and, and schools like Ole Miss, and there's a lot of schools like Ole Miss, they don't, they're never going to be able to swim in those waters. I mean, there's, there's no way that they're ever going to be able to go there. And, and interestingly – the school that Nick Saban has been at the last 15 years can't swim in those waters either. No, they can't do $31 million a year. No way. No way, Tyler. And you know it. They don't have that kind of corporate money. It's a, that Texas deal is a different deal. I, I'll tell you this. I talked to somebody who knows uh, the college football landscape as well as anyone on this planet. And he said, listen, if the rules stay the way they are right now, which is essentially no rules, three programs are going to leave the others in the dust. Texas, Texas A&M, and USC. And you agree. see that happening right now. It's already happening. I don't think that Alabama and Georgia, for all of the resources they have, Oklahoma, for all of the resources that it has, LSU, I don't think those programs can swim in those waters every single year the way that I do believe those three programs could. I will say this. I agree with what I agree with that part where I think Texas, Texas A&M, USC, no question they're going to come to the limelight, right? Mm -hmm. I think as long as I, – I, I went I gave you the funny face. As long as Nick Saban is at Alabama, NIL will not affect recruiting there. As well, long as he is there. Sure, but I mean, you know, Nick Saban. I mean, how long is that going mean, to be? Nick right? Saban turned 71 this next season. Right. I mean, that's, so, that's the million dollar know. question, but I think he's going to do it till he goes in the grave. I've said it. I mean, I, he told me 70, and he ain't, he's not even thinking about checking up. So, um, but I, I agree with that. Now, Georgia's interesting, LSU, all that stuff, but um, I think as long because Nick can always, because here's what Nick, Nick's smart. Here's what Nick, sure. Nick will go, Nick will go. Okay, such and such got uh, fifty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars for going to Texas A and M. What's he doing now? Okay, this guy came here. This guy, you know, the value that Nick creates for the player once they're there, um, as long as Nick is there, is so much more. And then what you're seeing with Georgia, Kirby's kind of doing the same thing from a coach's standpoint. Now, if I'm not at Georgia, if I'm not at Alabama, I'm probably panicking a little bit. Um, but the problem that you know where I get. This here, I think Lane was being funny. Okay. I think that was Lane's attempt at humor. I don't think Lane was intentionally taking a shot at Jimbo. I think that was Lane trying to be funny, um, saying something that he thought was out there and it was a joke with everybody. Yeah. You know, it's funny because people kept saying, well, Lane Kiffin's body bagging Texas AM. And I thought, no, no, he's, no he's not. Lane he's Kiffin's trying to be funny. Lane and Lane Kiffin's also sending a message to the Ole Miss fans that, hey, we're either going to get with this NIL thing. Or we're going to get left behind. And it was also his way of saying, in this environment, it's going to be very difficult to recruit the elite player to come to your school when other schools are offering 10 yeah. times more. That's yeah, what he I said. He I thought being... his baseball or football analogy about free agency was dead on. Perfect. Yeah, it was I mean, good. If, if two NFL teams are allowed to spend 10 times, if you allow the, the, the Pittsburgh Steelers to spend 10 times what the Detroit Lions spend, well, where do you think the free agents are going? Pittsburgh or Detroit? The Yankees say hello. And, and then, and then if you, yeah, and then if you change the, if you change that, and everyone goes, well, Pittsburgh's a better franchise. Okay, well, Detroit can pay ten times more. Where do you think the players going? It's going to Detroit. Right. And so that's what Kiffin said. I thought he was exactly right. I didn't think that was body bagging anybody at that particular point. I didn't think he was even trolling. I thought he was just being honest. Yeah, I think he he was like in his mind. I think it was like two different deals. I think he was completely trying to be funny about the Texas A&M thing, but then trying to make a point about. 
you know, the NIL and, the, and those things. Uh, I don't think he was taking a shot. And then Nick later on that night, so Nick was down in, I guess, Mobile at the – we used to do a thing the night before signing day. He still does it. It's some kind of – I don't know. It's, it's at the airport, the Brooklyn Airfield. It's some kind of thing out there we would fly into or right around there <clears throat> and speak to a big group and, you know, was making general – he never called anybody out by name. He never said text to him, you know, just very general about – he did say that we've never bought a kid here about recruiting and all that stuff, but you know, and that's where everybody like starts raising their eyebrows, you know, allegedly. I mean, whatever. Um, but you know, you sit. If you, don't know that was, you, if you don't know that you bought something, you didn't technically buy it. Look, he's he's very look. Nick Saban, like everybody talks about. Look, Nick Saban's a smart dude. Now they can say what they want to. That's a smart man. Of course. Okay? Um, and. Jimbo hears all this, and then I think Jimbo's just tired of hearing the shit, you know, and I think he just had a moment where he, you know, um, and Jimbo is a great dude, okay, and I'm talking about great salt of the earth dude. I've known Jimbo since 1998. Yeah, Mm -hmm. great dude, and I think he was just tired of hearing it. I think he had, you know, Freeze got to that point where he was tired of hearing it, and, you know, he said what he said. Now, um, he's got the right to do that. He's got the right to to call people clowns and all that stuff. I thought that the most fascinating fact that I, I don't know if I know, you and I know, I don't know how much the fans understand this, is that they're all represented by the same guy. Yeah. Okay? They all know each other. Okay? So here's the way I, I've really – I've had a little uh, – about two or three days to think about this. So this is what it reminds me of. Okay? So it's like – Lane's like uh, like South Korea, right? So Lane just – he goes out. He'll just do whatever. He doesn't really care what everybody else thinks. He's going to shoot his rockets when he shoots his rockets. And South Korea just, or North Korea? North Korea. I'm sorry. What did okay. I say? South Korea? You said he's South North Korea. Korea. Okay. Yeah, he's just shooting his rockets when he wants to. He don't care what everybody else thinks. He's going to do it his way. He really don't care what you say. He's doing it his way. So you're saying that Lane Kiffin and, and is Kim jong Un. Yeah, Kim in this situation. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's, okay. just, he's shooting rockets. He's 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 got his doing it his way. He could care less what everybody else thinks. He really could. He, he does not care. Okay. And you got, and you got Jimbo here. Jimbo's like China. Okay. They, you know, they were, they were off away for a little bit and all of a sudden they've just resurrected and they got all these resources and technology and things. And now they're on the world stage now. Right. And they're challenging the world stage. And you got Nick that's kind of like the United States. He's just kind of doing his thing. He wins from time to time, just kind of running things. But here's the here's the trick: is they all have the button that they can burn this bitch down anytime they wanted to. Okay, they all know what everybody else does, and they know the truth. Okay, and they also know that they got they can they're vulnerable too. Okay, and so it's like every once in a while you'll get a jab at at, at cheating or doing something. You'll get this jab, but nobody ever breaks it open because those in glass houses do not throw stones. And so, so what do you think about NIL? Is it, is it, is it sustainable like this? It, does it, and then what do you, how do you feel? Cause I'll be honest with you. I get this question a lot and I have a hard time answering it. People are like, well, what would you do? You were, <laughs> you were put in charge. What would you do? And I'm like, ah, so I can see on one hand the need to put a cap on it. Right. And I think that's what a lot of coaches are for. And then there's the other part of me that goes, well, hold up a minute. Hold up a minute. Yeah. Most college players don't play in the NFL. And even those that do play in the NFL, most don't play in the NFL long enough to get independently wealthy. Correct. So this is their these this is this is a, an, an earning window that they have in front of them. Why should it be capped? I don't want my earning window capped. If someone came to me and said, hey, Neil, we don't think you should be able to sell any more ads on your podcast. Or we don't think you should ever be allowed to raise your rates. We don't. We think that there's a limit to how much money you should make. Then you're not living in America. I would push back on that and say, whoa, hold up. Hold up. If I want to make more money and I can figure out a way to make more money, I'm going to make more money. And so I, I have a hard time with so I've got to tell, well, I mean, I got to tell Bryce Young or CJ Stroud or um, Caleb Williams or any of these guys, just pick your player. I've got to tell him, hey, listen, for the, for the greater good, you're going to have to take a, a, a less money. You're going to make yours in the NFL, of course. And that's where Bryce Young goes, well, wait a minute. I could get hurt. I could have a catastrophic injury. I played th- this, this game. 
every game's not like the Pro Bowl where nobody tackles anybody. This is the this is the real thing. I'm not doing that. And and I would I would support the player in that instance. So I I think I'm at I know I don't think it. I, I got know a great I'm, example for you. Exactly what you're trying to say. Okay. How about a guy named Stetson Bennett? Okay. A guy sure. that we all know is not going to play in the NFL. Okay. Right. But how much money is he worth right now in NIL in in Athens, Georgia? I mean, seven figures. And he should yeah. go get every every dime of it. So that's, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can't, yeah, how are you going to limit that guy where it's not going to play a down in the NFL? You know, those, those are the situations that you can't, what you're saying. Of course. I mean, it, it, it's, but that's what coaches, a lot of coaches that are out there like, hey, let's let's send this thing to Congress. And, and I, I realize it's that, it's that greater good thing because coaches look at this and say, if these are the rules, the school where I am, we can't compete. I, I will give Kiffin credit for this. Uh, when he first went heavy on the portal, Tyler, and I told you this, I thought, man, this is risky. I mean, and it is, it is absolutely risky, but if I'm them and I know that I year in and year out, can't go compete for the five-star kid. There are only so many of those guys. Yeah, you run out of choices. You run out of choices. If my choices are, all right, I'm going to play the eval game. I'm going to eval and develop or. I can go just get in the portal and bring guys in and fill holes and try to win a handful of recruiting battles and do it that way. This way might be riskier, and it is. There's a low floor with this because if a bunch of guys leave at once and your program falls apart, your roster goes empty. Um, but there's a higher ceiling, and if you're in it to win every year and not cycle, it kind of makes sense. And I, I give him credit. I've gone – I've gone around and around with it in my head, and I've come to the conclusion that, look, Ole Miss went into the – like, take Ole Miss and Jackson Dart, for example. They get Jackson Dart out of the transfer portal. They weren't going to be able to get one of those quarterbacks out of the out of the high school ranks this year, a kid that has the upside of a, of a Dart. They weren't. They, they, they tried. They got in those in those recruiting battles, and at the end of the day, they, 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 they weren't able to pull those off, and those are going to be difficult. Yeah, the NIL to me – here, this is why everybody's complaining about NIL, in my opinion, okay, from a coach's standpoint, is, you know, and you've heard Jimbo said this twice now. He said it on Fine Bomb in January, and he said it at the SEC media days, that there's NIL has been around a long time. We just didn't call it NIL, okay? Well, now that it's become above board, allegedly, all right, that it's become above board, you have people that were not involved before, that now are getting 1099s. And so the amount of money being donated to the process has tenfolded, okay, if not more than that, okay? And so those people weren't involved in before. And so now the quote-unquote price per athlete has has gone up now that it's above board. Yeah, it's a, and it's a tax write-off. And it's a tax write-off. Mm -hmm. Problem two is, is that kind of stuff – Okay, didn't happen all over the country, contrary to popular belief. Okay, that was a southeastern blue blood issue in the last 25 years that I've been involved with. Okay, you didn't have to go out and worry about Oregon State getting a hold of somebody. Okay, that wasn't a problem. You didn't have to worry about Arizona, Arizona State, you know, uh, really Pac-12 period until a guy named Pete Carroll got there, and then he started going, and then they started, you know, starting getting guys from all over the country. Well, it doesn't happen by accident, right? It was more of a southeastern and blue blood program for a long time. Well, now it's a universal problem. Now you got it. Now you're having the guys in the ACC that wasn't used to dealing with it or having to deal with it. You know, you, it, so now it's a problem, okay? So that's that, that's one thing. The thing I find completely comical about this, this is what I find completely comical about this whole deal, is that this has been going on for years, but now we're going to complain about it today. It's like like the fact that I hear this, if I don't hear it once a day, I hear it 10 times a day. It's like, well, you know, it's a recruiting inducement. We don't do that. Like, so you're telling me that you're shocked that for the last 20 years, they've been paying people under the table, highly illegal for 20 years, but you don't think they're going to have a conversation about, hey, if you come here, we'll get you this NIL. Like, you don't think they're going to do that? When they've been paying them under the table, like of course. they're gonna have a phone conversation, okay? Like, and it's like I just well, it's find it the kids, the kids are asking the question in, in on visits and in living rooms and stuff. Hey, what about nil? What, what, what? 
What's the coach is supposed to say? Oh, listen, we can't talk about that. Can't talk about that. It's like this. It's like when, it's, when what when, they do is they say, let me tell you who to call. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or, or just say it, there's no way to prove it. Right. Okay. Like if they can hide paying a kid money, they can hide having a conversation with a kid. It's not, this is like, I mean, this is not mind shocking news. And that people and that people are complaining of. Oh man, I'm talking about public now. I'm talking about coaches are going out there in public and, and talking about you know recruiting inducements and stuff like that. The same coaches are tampering like hell in the portal, tampering like hell. Like guys, look, when you're in the transfer portal for an hour and a half and then you're out and you're going to a new school, do you think in an hour and a half you just had some kind of like enlightening moment in your brain that you decided that's where you're going to go to school? No, like. What are we doing? Like, it's common sense, and people don't realize it. And it's just, again, it's the pot calling the kettle black. It's those in glass houses don't need to throw stones, however you want to put it. But it, it, it's it's insane to me of, about how we are getting so hell-bent about people cheating and breaking rules when, hell, everybody's doing it. Everybody is doing it. I well, mean, now literally now everybody is. Well, yeah, well, now literally it's it's being – Literally everyone. It's being encouraged. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 been incentivized. In the past, you know, you didn't have anything to gain for it from it, right? If you were a business owner or whatever and you gave a kid ten thousand dollars to go to your favorite school, that's money you lost. I mean, you can't write that off. Well now, yeah. You can I mean he can advertise for your business and you can write the money off. There's something you can get out of it. Yeah, sure. So the the question that I have moving forward, and well, it's for probably another day, but I am really interested to see. Like I saw where Alabama is about to try to build a new basketball arena, and um, you know, Ole Miss is trying to do this this major uh, capital oh, campaign yeah. for for athletics. When you hit up these boosters, now they say, or at least they think to themselves, well, what's better for the school? Is it to me to give you? you know, $50,000 to go towards the football stadium? Or is it for me to do a NIL deal with to help you get a player so that I can come cheer for that player and that player can market my business and I can write it off as a tax, as a tax write-off? I, yeah, I think I agree with you on that. That's that's what's that, going to be challenging for the ADs and, and fundraisers out there is that now you're, you're kind of competing against yourself for those dollars. The universities are going to have to allocate money in different ways. We actually, I, I may have said it to somebody about that on your show one time um, about that as, the, you know, there's a way to allocate the money, the amount of money that the school, especially in the SEC, are getting to the SEC network is plenty of money to build whatever they need to build, okay? But they would like to allocate that money for a different use, okay, whether it be in the university or whatever. So whoever's in charge of allocating money, that's where the pressure is going, going to be there. And then, like you're saying, as the guy, that, okay, we wanted this money to go to the library and not the new basketball arena. Okay, so, all right, do I need you to donate to the uh, nonprofit organization that benefits NIL, or do I need you to do the capital fund here that's going to go to our new arena? You know, that, that's yeah, going to sure. be a, you know, and I think that's where you're going to see what you were talking about earlier. I think that's where you're going to see the Texas A&M, Texas, USC's the world blow up, you know, and, and get big because, I mean, they got, they're, they're, they're crawling with it. They have more money. Um, now, I can tell you this. I can tell you at, at, at Alabama and Georgia, they're not even going to let you ask them. They're going to tell you, send this to the send this to the NIL. That's what they're going to want to do. I mean, because yeah. it's just – it's important to them. So, um, you know, that's going to be interesting. But, all right, moving on, let's talk a little bit about uh, – I want to talk a little bit before we finish this up with a nuclear bomb here. But uh, let's, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about this Brian Flores deal. I was completely – fascinated with it a little bit and really probably shocked, I guess, that whoever is representing him and the attorney allowed him to put that out there um, at the timing that he, that they put it out there. Um, Brian Flores is a ball coach. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he is a bona fide, what he, what he's done at Miami. I mean, he, and the, and the one, they fired him. Okay. But this is, and then he goes and does a lawsuit. And he he he's going. He was going to get a job. He still may get a job. But where I get, I'm still like bothered by the timing of it. Like I probably would have said, "Hey, look, I'm with you." Okay, I understand that. Let's get. Let's see if we get a job first. 
Um, because <sighs> See, I struggle with this, man. I do. I, I, I struggle with this a lot. You've known me for a long time, Tyler. I, I, I think I'm a pretty pragmatic person. It is difficult for me, and let me make this clear. I'm not saying that uh, that African Americans get the same opportunities in the NFL. They, they they obviously don't. I'm not saying that they get as many opportunities to fail as their white counterparts. It appears that that, that there, there might be some validity there. But is Brian Flores the guy that should be the poster child for this? Brian Flores is 40 years old. Brian Flores has already been an NFL head coach. Those jobs aren't easy to get. And he was he was he was getting six interviews in this cycle and was almost certainly going to get an NFL head coaching job. So let's assume for a moment that Brian Flores was going to get one of those jobs. When a guy at the age of 40 has two NFL head coaching jobs, it's difficult for me to, to, to see the argument that he is being discriminated against. You, you have the opportunity. And then I've, I, I know too many people in the league, and you do too. Yeah. That league's about one thing. Winning. That's it. It's, 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 it's one of the great things about sports. And he can win. That league's about winning. If, if you offered today to the Buffalo Bills, say, hey, look, there's a guy that he can take you to the Super Bowl. He will take you to the Super Bowl. Now, he's an alien from another yeah. planet. They say, sign me up. Yeah. They just don't. They, they don't. They they don't that's, that's the way the league's built. The and league's it's not even just the NFL. Winning. And I will say this too: It's not just the NFL; it's college too. It's everything, okay? Because it's the great part when, about when sports, your, right? When your job, in you know, um, when your job is is determined on whether you win or lose football games, yeah, okay. And I've and I've told you know over the years, over twenty years, uh, why'd y'all take that guy? You took this guy because of this. You took this guy because of that. And I tell everybody: If you can help me win games because I have to feed my family. Yep. Come on with it. Let's go. Yours because, is a scoreboard business. And yeah, if, if someone can day, help you score more points than the other team, then you're taking them. At the end of the day, we get hired and fired based on winning football games. Yep. Okay? And sometimes it's not even your fault. Hell, I've been fired twice. One time I got we got fired. Uh, we set – I was a receivers coach and passing game guy. We set every record. We set a 100-year-old school record. We still got fired. It doesn't even matter. It's about wins and losses. Yes. Period. Yes. Okay? And I don't care – I don't care anything about anything. I don't care what your religion is, your, if you have sexuality. I don't care. Do we win games, yes or no? Yep. And this guy's a ball coach, man. He wins games. And whoever allowed him to do that before, I mean, like, look, if you, I will say this, if, and this is where my point was, like, look, if you make it through all this cycle with all these open jobs and you don't, and you don't get a job, we got a problem. Let, let's, let's put this out there. Okay. I'm with you. Let's do it. But he literally didn't get one job. And then, and then the whole Bill Belichick deal, the text that came out, that was kind of – I was like, you know, that, thought, is that not the most Bill Belichick text message you've ever seen in your life? I thought the Giants' response to that was really strong. Yeah. If, if I were Brian Flores' uh, attorney team, legal team, uh, I, I would have I been discouraged by the way that the Giants fought back. And the, the the specific nature with which the Giants fought back, I, I would, I would be deeply concerned that we are about to embarrass ourselves in a court of law. And I know everyone says, "Well, there's more coming. There's more coming. There's more more people and all that." That's that's fine. You, you you better have more than what Flores appears to have, because I don't think Flores has a case. I don't think he has a winnable case. Does he have a case that can create some? Some uh, PR problems for the NFL, probably. Does he have a case that can lead to some some pressure being applied by the league to certain franchises to make a different hire? Maybe so. But at the yeah. end of the day, you're telling an owner who owns a team what to do. And it doesn't matter. That's the thing that's different about the NFL than their in their league is there's only has to be one person, and that's the owner. Yeah. And they don't have to answer to anybody. Okay. And there's no booster club. There's no president. There's no message boards. They literally flick the bird to everybody and, and do what they want to do. And the Giants did what everyone in the NFL does. It's a copycat league. The Giants went out and hired a GM and a coach from Buffalo from Buffalo what, because they they're, like they're, they're looking at a model that appears to be working in Buffalo. And the Giants have a lot of money invested in, in Daniel Jones. 
And there's a lot of similarities in some ways between Jones and, and Josh Allen. And they said, Hey, let's bring Brian Dayball in here. And, and he can, maybe he can do some semblance of the same thing with Jones that he did in Buffalo with Allen. And we can get ourselves kind of out of this spiral and, 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 back into the winning ways where they were when you had Tom Coughlin and Eli Manning and all those guys there. So that that's very clearly what they're trying to do. It just doesn't hold up. It's we, we, we're going to talk about Brian Harson in a little while. The most frustrating thing for me about Brian, the Brian Harson thing is people suddenly out of the blue going racist. We, we got to stop that as a society, man, this, this race card at every turn is, it, it is dangerous from a societal standpoint. I mean, there will be people that hear me say that they go, that's racist to say that. You can't just call everybody a racist. That can't be the 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 go-to, that, that can't be your playbook. You gotta be, I mean, if you're gonna play that card, you better be able to prove it. Cause it's 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 really dangerous. And and that's the part of this that I didn't like. It's it's how exactly are you being discriminated against when you at the age of 37 got an NFL head coaching job? Well, the thing to me is, you know, is filing a lawsuit about getting a job. I, I guess, again, I have a I have a master's of education and a doctorate of common sense. Okay, so if I'm your representation, okay, and this is about getting a job, okay, you're talking about there are 32 open jobs. There are 32 possible spots. That's it. There's 32. Right. This isn't like you're going to work at corporate America where there's hundreds of thousands of opportunities. And you can just 30, create a, a spot to give you a promotion. This is, there's 32 head coaches. Yeah, 32 spots. Right. Okay. Where you were going to interview for, what is it, seven jobs or whatever he was interviewing? Six, six or I seven. Think, yeah. yeah. And I would have been shocked if he did not get one of those. Um, he was a proven commodity. But when you start the lawsuit, it wasn't about the, and I know the race thing is the whole race thing, but for me, it, it was more of the, Okay, there's 30 from a coach's standpoint, it was more of the the okay, there's 32 spots. Now here's what we're fixing to do. Okay, I'm calling out the Giants. That's I'm now I'm down to 31. I'm calling out the Broncos. Now I'm down to 30. I'm calling out the I'm throwing Bill Belichick, who's my mentor. I'm throwing him into the I'm throwing him, which is the GOAT. That's like pissing off Nick Saban. Not a good idea. Okay, so now I don't know how many I've pissed off with that one. And then, and then you just – the owners are like a tight-knit group, right? Because you always have the owners versus this. Sure. Now you're calling out your owner for for trying to buy you off for draft picks. Well, he's going to talk to other owners too that are his buddies. So there's no telling how many of the 32 you've eliminated at this point. And so you've cut your, your employment window down by at least half. Whereas, look, if you go through and told me – he comes and says, hey, I want to sue for this. I would have simply said, look, you're there's – I would have been shocked if he didn't get one of those jobs. But now at this point, he doesn't even wait till the cycle's over with. He because he doesn't get one job, he go he went all nuclear. Yeah. And now yeah. it's just it, bad timing, man. I suspect when this entire story comes out as to who's behind this and it's there's something bigger than this. It's about and it came out at now a time. Be- yeah, it came out at a time so that we'll talk about it right before the Super Bowl. I mean, there's a you know, the the Bengals and Rams play in the Super Bowl on Sunday, and this is going to be a topic of conversation now this week. It just feels like he's being he's being used, and I'm sure he's I suspect he's being compensated. Um to I hope so. Well, I mean, I I guess I hope so for his sake. I just so far, and I've I tried to follow it because I knew what would happen in my field. I mean, this won't surprise you, Tyler. I'm not super popular among other sports media. Maybe that hey, maybe that's why you and I get along so well. It could be. You know, you know, I, I knew what would happen when this came out. It would be this blind, oh God, the league is is racist. The league discriminates against black coaches. We must do something. I knew that would be the media reaction, the talking heads, and it it was. I mean, Bomani Jones comes on and says, the problem is white people. Can you imagine that comment? And it just passes in this environment. It's like, oh yeah, that's cool. Yeah, you're right. That's the problem. He had a head coaching job before the age of 40. Tyler, you work in the field. You know how many really good coaches, white, black, and otherwise, never get head coaching opportunities because the time just doesn't work out. You know how many people that happens to. You know how many people get head coaching opportunities 
they get it. It's the, the timing's not good. It's a, it's the environment's not good. They can't get it off the ground. They never get another chance. You see it all the time. You I'll see it all the time. And so when this happens, how can a guy who at the age of 36, 37, come off Bill Belichick staff, did a great job with the Patriots as a def- essentially a defensive coordinator, helped them win a Super Bowl, holding a, a team to three points, held the Rams to three points in a Super Bowl. He gets rewarded for his work with the head coaching job with the Miami Dolphins. It didn't work out for a number of reasons. The NFL's complicated. You better have a quarterback. We see that all the time, right? I mean, look who's in the court. Look who's in the Super Bowl. It's Matthew Stafford. It's Joe Burrow. It's, I mean, pretty two pretty good quarter. It's a quarterback league. And so maybe sometimes things just don't exactly work out. Your your former boss Nick Saban didn't have a great run in in the NFL because in large part he didn't have a great quarterback to to put out on the field. But sometimes you get fired because somebody pees in the end zone. I mean, stuff exactly. Stuff happens. I mean, so but but Brian Flores got one of those jobs, and was getting interviewed for another one of those jobs. It just it to me it feels like someone or some group with a much bigger agenda is behind this. And I don't think they thought it out very well. I think they wanted to hurry and, and they picked the wrong guy to, to be there. I mean, you know, then you Marvin Lewis gets involved in it. And, and, and I met Marvin Lewis once in Cincinnati could not have been a nicer man. Great, great dude. But Marvin Lewis didn't win in Cincinnati. Was it Marvin Lewis's fault that he didn't win in Cincinnati? I mean, you're the head coach, but no, there was other things. He was there, what, nine, ten years? And, and they just didn't get Long it done. Time. And then I don't know how much validity your argument has when your replacement in year two has his team in the Super Bowl. I mean, they drafted better. They took Burrow. They got they got the first pick. They took a a, a franchise quarterback, obviously, in Burrow. They, they turned out to make a really smart first-round pick this year when they went with Jamar Chase. <laughs> and, and, you know, it works out, but that's the league. I mean, if you draft the right players – and they stay healthy, you, you you have a shot. And if you don't, well, then you don't. And it just feels like you you just barked up the wrong tree is what this feels like. But, hey, look, in the environment we live in today, with everything being so politically and racially charged, if the goal was to get more guys head coaching jobs now, it's probably going to work. You know, and, I, and I've said this before. I, I think I said in the summertime and all this stuff, but this is why I'm a, I'm a firm believer, and I think – from a coach's standpoint, I think everybody else is with us from a coaching standpoint. From the inside, politics don't belong in the football locker room, period. And, again, it doesn't matter. I told this story before. We never, not one time, okay, I've been in a lot of huddles, okay. I've been in a lot of huddles. Not one time in any huddle or practice I've been at was the conversation, hey, who are you voting for or who did you vote for? That was never a conversation. Hey, it wasn't, it's the last, the football locker room is the last great American place, okay? Because nobody cares about race. Nobody, I mean, nobody cares about politics. Nobody cares about COVID. Nobody cares about wearing masks because you're in it for a common cause or for the greater good. Well, that's how sure. I was raised, sure. right? And and I think every time something happens and Trump, somebody tries to shove politics in the football Okay, sooner or later, it gets ejected back out. Okay, because it doesn't belong. It do, it's the last great, a team sport locker room is the last great thing on this planet. And it was like, you know, it's all about when, when, you're, when you try to force, force belief, it, it's, not, it's not what you do to family. And that's what a football locker room is. And everybody's like, you know, everybody says that word family, right? And everybody's like, oh, they're not a family. Some people say family. Family, that's right. Some people, right. but at the end of the day, it really is. Sure. You know, some people aren't saying, you know, some families are closer than others. Sure. Okay. But at the end of the day, I did not care, and no coach cared, no player cared, and we might not even like each other. Okay. We legit may not even like each other, but if we went outside, like I can mess with you and you can mess with me, but once we leave these doors and somebody else starts messing with you, now there's a problem. You're going to stand. It's like having a brother that you don't sure. like a whole lot. But by God, he's my, at the end of the day, he's my brother. Right. And that's why politics, and I've said it from day one, and I'll continue to say it. Politics do not belong in a football locker room, period. End of the day, end of the discussion on that, is on, on politics being shoved. And that's what a lot of coaches are pissed off about. A lot of players are pissed off about politics being shoved in the locker room from 
from the media or from whatever it is. I'm not throwing you in the media, but you know what I'm talking about. Like media oh, sure. is, is trying to drive this stuff in there. Well, all the, uh, all, when's the media day? Tuesday, Wednesday in, in Los Angeles? Whenever the big media day is, I don't know if they'll have it. And, and if you have a media day in this environment, I don't, you know, I might. I've, I've learned right. that people apparently think that the media have a higher percentage of COVID. But um, if they well, have actually. A, it's actually what the best part is, is it's like the really the players and people really don't want to do the interviews. And so like, oh, COVID, let's uh, can't do it. But the reality is now, now guys are going to be asked this question about, you know, uh, African-American coaches in the NFL. And do you think it's and the guys are going to be asked this question and not all of those guys are going to be particularly equipped to answer it. And someone's going to say something he didn't mean to say. It's going to come out wrong. It's going to become headlines. Mark my words. Oh, and yeah. it, it, instead of instead of the focus being about the stories of these two teams and how they got there, because they're, you know, it's two completely different stories for how these two teams got to a, to this Super Bowl. And there's a lot of players in the Super Bowl that are great stories. And, you know, instead of it being that the focus is and, and the league has to be quite frustrated with that, that the focus is going to be on all of the, the politics of the whole mask thing and COVID in Los Angeles. And then the, the Brian Flores lawsuit, those are going to be the two big headlines, bigger headlines than, Rams, Bengals. Yeah, but inside – and I, we need to move on. But inside the locker room, it's like this. It's like there's so – you come from so many different backgrounds, okay? So many different social economic statuses. It doesn't matter, okay? But if a teammate says – if a teammate came to me and is like, is uncomfortable about it, by God, let's go address it. Me and you, I'm, I'm standing with you, let's go. Because he's my teammate, okay? Because he is hurting, okay? Because he needs – but – that's why stuff doesn't belong in the locker room because that doesn't – it's not – like people don't understand is like the only thing that's important inside of a locker room is each other. And and people sure. – I think a lot of times, you know, people get used to playing video games and stuff and think it's like a normal world. It is not a normal world inside of a locker room. It's a very protected deal. I mean, I've told you this. I could go – I mean, you. I've dealt – I mean, you've talked about this. I, I may be locked in and like, hey, what's going on in the world today? Like I legitly have no clue what's going on you're you're so sheltered uh from the outside noise so all right speaking of outside noise we're gonna go ahead and transition into this bad boy all right you like how war I eagle. there let's go war eagle yes sir. Right, i have a unique perspective on this and i think you do too yeah um you covered them for a long time and i think when i was leaving was when you started covering them i i left my last year was 98 when was your last year when was your first year 98 okay so you actually got the you covered that season, correct? I did. It was my first my first day on the Auburn beat was the first day in pads of ninety eight camp. Okay. Were you there? Yeah. So you saw the little Siski running around, and you didn't even know it. I had no idea. That had no idea. All right. So that was, that was him. So here here here's the deal is this was in, unless you're under a rock for the last week. Um, there has been a, to me, it's an attempted coup, uh, by the power brokers. Um, you're going to be laughing. See, so you, you're going to let me, you're going to go ahead and let me fall on the sword. I, I appreciate you. Hell out of you for that one. All right. So there's been an attempted coup by the power brokers at Auburn. This is, and, and another one, another one. Okay. <laughs> and this is not, and this has been, that's why I asked about 98. Cause there was one in 98 that was successful. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was at Sewell Hall, Neil, after coming back from the movies, before we played Louisiana Tech, when a Terry Bowden walked in the walked in the room and said, "If he's powerful enough to get rid of the governor of the state of Alabama, he's powerful enough to get rid of me," and walked out. I was there. Wow, I was there. Okay, a lot of people wasn't there that day. I was I was not at Sewell Hall that day, but I was hightailing it to Friday Auburn. night about six thirty ish, right after the move. Six thirty seven. It was dark outside, and it was. It was like when it had turned dark at five thirty. It was just time had just changed. Tell you a little, tell you a little story here. I don't know if I've ever told you this before. This was my first year on the Auburn beat. I mean, you cannot imagine the chaos. I mean, I knew no one. Had very few sources. It was just, just fighting for my life against Charles Goldberg and Philip Marshall and all these guys who've been covering Auburn forever. And I knew I was in trouble, right? And um, I got a kind of a tip. In a, in a way, earlier that week. No it, Twitter back then, or text message. There's no Twitter. Someone told me, and I can't remember how it was. There was email back then because I, I, I didn't It just it. started. Yeah, I, it might have been someone sent something to my AOL account. 
telling me that you hey, just dated yourself. Terry Bowden might step down this week. And I this is a lesson for all if, if you're a future journalist out there. First, get out. Second, if you insist <laughs> on staying in. The lesson is you can never ignore a rumor. You know how many times I've texted you and go, hey, I heard this. Just checking. Yeah. You're like, no, nah, dude, there's no. Nah. But I learned this because I never checked on that one. And when it went down, I was like, oh, my God. Uh, I never told anybody that for a long time because I knew that would, was probably a fireable offense. Um, yeah, this is not a Terry Bowden deal, but I did. So how I found out was after class at like, this is like noon or one o'clock after class, I went over. I remember I was in Brian Turner. It was a long snapper. It was me, him, Damon Duvall. You remember Damon Duvall? Yeah, I remember Damon. And we were in his dorm room playing NCAA football on the original PlayStation, <laughs> waiting to go to uh, walkthroughs. And then so I go in there, and he's and his dad calls him. So Brian's uh, Turner's from uh, Wetumpka. And so his dad kind of knew a bunch of people and all that stuff. And he's like, my dad just called and said he, he heard that Coach Bowden's getting fired today. I'm like, man, shut up. When we were at practice yesterday, this is no Twitter. All, this is pre all that. And uh, and we go to walkthroughs, and he's there. So nobody's going to ask him, hey, Coach, you're getting fired today. And then it's, this all happened after after the movie, before you went to the hotel. We came back to eat, eat dinner, and there it was. But All right, so this is a coup, attempted coup by the power brokers. Let's get back to it. To get their stroke back. Um, I think it's been if, if – um, if you're an Auburn person or inside to know enough people, it's there was definitely some disconnect um, with who got to make the decision when Harson got the job, um, and the AD made the hire, and it, and it was basically saying, "Hey, look, I mean, this is what we're doing," and he makes the hire. That's what he was hired to do. Um, I know we both know Green real well. Um, he was here at Ole Miss when I was here the first time. Good at his job, and. You know, it's 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 amazing how ads get viewed in the public eye because of like fan, you know, the fan, the fanatic part of it, how it clouds people's judgment on good ads or bad ads. But I think he's good at his job. Okay, so he decides to hire Harson. Do I agree with the hire? That that doesn't matter. Okay, that that's not that's not on this deal. But I think you're skipping a key part of this, though. Okay, go ahead. And, and just filling in, it's kind of filling in the blank for anybody who has been living under a rock, is that Alan Green didn't follow through the last time on what the power brokers wanted after a successful coup to get rid of Gus Malzahn. They wanted, I think they wanted Kevin Steele, but I don't think they wanted Brian Harson. And I think Brian Harson was Alan Green's hire. And at the time, Alan Green had power. And now, what is it, a year later, eight, 15, 18, whatever it is yeah. later. Here and change. Uh, now the power has shifted. The green doesn't really have the power, and the the powerful boosters do. Yeah, and, and, I, and I will say this, and I'll make sure because I know a lot of people that listen to this know Kevin Steele and I are dear friends, okay? We know each other. It's not a surprise. I mean, we live, We were next-door neighbors. We, we never were further than 20 feet apart, literally, for about two and a half years. Um, go, we go on vacation in the summertime. I go by and see him for a day. We vacation in the same spots and things like that. But sure. um, I, he has never told me that, just for the record. And I want to make sure. It's not like I know something that I'm not telling. I want to make sure everybody knows that. Um, I actually – I, when I know friends like Mario getting a Miami job, I know when friends are involved in things, I try to stay as far away from it as I can for plausible deniability because my phone rings off the hook. And I can literally say, I don't know. I haven't talked to him. That's mm -hmm. literally become my new thing, especially this year. We got Rich Rod getting a Jacksonville State job, McIntyre getting the FIU job, Sumrall getting a Troy job. And it's like, T -t 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 my phone, I haven't talked to him. And I don't. I, I just I stay clear. That's what I usually do. So, um anyway long story short like true true facts by the way now that we mentioned steel this this honestly happened so i called steel he had called me or texted me or something i called him back this was i don't know last week at like seven o'clock on my way home from work and we start talking and i'm talking to him about maryland and then he's like dude i took the job like an hour and a half ago to go to miami i was like what 
I was like, is it out there yet? And he goes, oh, yeah, it's out there. Like, I had no idea. Yeah, okay? He was like, in Maryland for, what, like a, a, a week? He never went, I don't think. I don't think he ever went. Okay. I don't think he ever showed up. I think he was going. Um, I don't think he ever showed up. To my, own. I don't. He didn't. That's what I got from the conversation. But yeah, I didn't even know. Like Twitter knew before I knew, and we're friends. Okay, and we talk a lot. Like that's weird, but sure. coaches just don't talk about what job they're going to all the time. We talk about family and other things like friends do. Um, and co- you have so many changes, you just just part of the deal, which is mm-hmm. terrible if you're going to be in this business. I should probably use that to my advantage some. But all right, so. This has been going on since 98, though, okay? Um, they get Bowden out. They bring Tuberville in, okay? Then we had Jetgate, okay? And Jetgate, who are they going to go try to hire? Bobby Petrino. Petrino, who was a what? Former coordinator, mm-hmm. okay? And those coordinators are the people who know the power brokers. We're going to have a – we're going to start seeing a little semblance here, okay? So when Tuberville finally – they finally get him out, okay? Because I guess they didn't like beating Alabama nine straight times or whatever. They beat them every year, it felt like. But when they finally got tired of beating Alabama and that wasn't good enough anymore, and they wanted to win the big one, which he got screwed out of, by the way, in whatever year that was, three or four or whatever it was. Oh, four. Oh, four. Um, but that wasn't good enough anymore. So what did they do? They went and hired a former coordinator. And it was like, where did this guy come from? Like, yeah, I remember hiring Chiswick was like a bad – like they pissed a lot of people off because he had like a losing record at Iowa State as a one-year coordinator, right? A one-year head coach or something. Yeah, he left Auburn to go to Texas as a defensive coordinator and then went to Iowa State as a head coach and, and, and struggled. And then so they hire him, pissed a lot of people off, okay? He wins a national championship, okay? Speaking of having a good quarterback, it helps. Okay, wins a national championship, and then guess what? They run him out to hire who? A former coordinator, okay, and Gus Malzahn, okay. Gus starts they, – they get ready to run Gus out. They tried to run Gus out there every year, it felt like, for like the last six years. They finally they finally succeeded. And who were they trying to hire? A former coordinator, okay. And so now you brought – this is the first time, really, they tried to bring somebody in, I guess since Tuberville maybe. Um, but, you know, since Tuberville is now in the Senate, he, he knows how to – he knows the right people. To, yeah, to and, and, and depending on how you how – you, go back and remember the Tuberville thing. I mean, there was, there was always a rumbling um, after it was done that Tommy Tuberville coached that entire season sort of knowing he was the next guy at Auburn. I don't know whether Which I – Which is like, yeah, I don't – I don't, I, know, I that I, I don't know that I completely believe it, but I've heard it from enough people that I don't know – I'm not willing to completely discount it either. Right. But – the point of the drill is this, is this really, I mean, the last 20 years, it's the first guy outside of the network, okay, that, yeah, sure. that, that, that's been here, and that pissed a lot of people off. And he's okay. a total outsider. He wasn't a guy that had been in the Southeast. Yeah, no, no relation. No, and, and and when you see the guys that were they were trying to get, you know, um, they knew, you know, they tried to get Kirby a couple of years ago. They, it's not like they're not afraid to go outside the network, but they wanted somebody that knew what was going on in the league, right? Mm-hmm. And so – here we sit, and and I'm not even going to address the per, the rumors that have been some of these rumors been thrown out there. It's a disgrace. I'll tell you this: there's some rumors out there that are a complete disgrace, and and you should be embarrassed. Um, I'm embarrassed, okay. And and look, I, I have been with a bunch of programs since I left Auburn, but I grew up an Auburn fan. I actually put the uniform on. Uh, my wife graduated from there. I went to school, I guess most – I literally went four years there and, and finished up at Troy after I transferred when Tobro got the job. But there's a big part of me in, like, Auburn's not – I mean, Auburn is a special place. And it always will be, even though I, I didn't like the way what went down when I left. And I got some personal stuff that, that my friends know, the reason that they're – you know, I was pissed off for a long time. But I wasn't really ever pissed off at Auburn. I was pissed off at the people representing Auburn, Okay. But Auburn's a special place, just like a lot of – we got a lot of Ole Miss fans listening, obviously. Just like Ole Miss is a special place for a lot of Ole Miss fans, okay? It was special to me. And if I had to say I was a fan of somebody, that would be – you know, it, it, it's not a game to me there. It's more of that's – it's different. And a lot of people – I've heard people – I think you at one point in time, it's cultish sometimes probably, you know, there's – you get it. I mean, it's uh, I was, it's, I was on that campus for almost every day for six years. It was, you know, and I was an outsider, obviously. Um, and yeah, it was, but it was, I always was struck by, and I've, I've said this, I said this on the Oxford Exxon podcast on Monday. I was always struck by how much people who went there loved it. Yeah, I, I can't explain it to you. 
Neil. I can't. It's one of the reasons I, I got my oldest daughter when she was looking at schools. I was like, you should look at Auburn. Because I, I, it was one of the things that had always struck me in those years that I covered Auburn was the the way people felt about that school. It was, you know, it was something that, I mean, I joke about, but I mean, you know, I, I went to two, I guess I went to three schools in total and I never really felt like that. They were always just kind of schools. And um, for, for Auburn people, it was always something, I mean, not I'm sure they're not for everybody, but I mean, I met a lot of Auburn people working in Mobile and they were, man, they loved it. You know, I find myself, this is funny, you and I have had this conversation. I'm not really a fan of, you know, what I did for a living kind of made me not a fan, right? So sure. I'm not a fan of anybody. I worked at places, and what, and I can sit here and look you dead in the face and say, I, I, I could care less if they won a football game or not. I didn't watch anything. I didn't watch baseball, basketball. I watched any of that stuff the whole time I was working. But now that I've been out of it for a year or two, I find myself start watching Auburn play again. So it's kind of like, you know, it's like it's it's down it's very deep and it's way down there. It's like well, what what does my man of Talladega Knight say? It's very deep down there where it doesn't come out anymore. <laughs> but it's it's starting to like I, I find myself yeah. watching Auburn play basketball. Now, does it help that they're the number one team in the country? Sure. Of course. But I was watching them in the preseason when they wasn't ranked high. I watched them, you know, I find myself starting to watch th- watch them every week in football and things like that. So um, but it is a special place, will always be a special place to me, and it's embarrassing as an Auburn person. And I can honestly say that, I, I, you know, I have been an Auburn person long enough to say this. It's embarrassing to the community, to the family, that this is going on. I don't know who's doing it. Um, I have my suspicions, but I'm definitely not going to say that on a freaking podcast. Yeah. I probably, I'm probably pretty damn close. I know who's doing it. Um, it's embarrassing. It really is. It's a shame uh, about the rumors that were thrown out there because you didn't want to pay a buyout. OK, but here's the deal. What's his his left on his contract is like 18.2 million. I think he's owed 70 percent of that if, if they buy him out. Here's my suggestion. OK, the damage has been done. OK, you have handicapped him beyond all belief. OK, you've handicapped him beyond all belief. Even if you wanted him to be successful, it, it's going to be damn near impossible for him to do it now. But I'm you're not going to find what you owe him, by the way. It's like 12 and change. I heard now see if that's right. That's what I got. I got that from an inside source. Yeah, twelve point seven four million dollars. Okay, I was. That's that's right. It's twelve and change what they owe him. Okay, here's my suggestion: pay the man. Okay, pay him. Agreed. And let him go. Agreed. Because if you keep him now, all right. And let me explain to you how recruiting works. The damage okay? is done now. You damage can't. is done. Yeah, you can't. So you fired. You fired Gus. And mm-hmm. so that. So what year was that? That'd have been the twenty twenty class, correct? Or twenty twenty one class? 2021 class. 2021, yeah. All right. You don't have those relationships established, so you ha- we call those like half classes, okay? And the portal wasn't what it is now, so it was truly a half class, mm-hmm. okay? 2022, okay, wasn't up to the Auburn standard. Why was it not up to the Auburn standard? Because the man's not cheating, okay? I can tell you that for 100% fact. He is not cheating in recruiting, okay? I can tell you that for 100% fact. The man is not cheating in recruiting. Okay, they can everybody can accuse what you want to. Trust me, he is not cheating in recruiting. So you're not going to find that. Yeah. To try to, and that's what they wanted to find. And in fact, and they they, they, they've, they've sort of tried to shift some of that around and and label him a racist. Yeah. Now it's he's a racist. Now he's yeah. he's not treating people the right way. Uh, and look, man, when, when you coach hard, I'm not saying this guy's freaking, uh, you know. Dabo Sweeney or anything, I, and but guys, there's a lot of coaches that aren't. Okay, there's a you lot of coaches him. out there. You hired him, and he was a head coach before you hired him. If 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 he if he's the type of head coach that you didn't want, that's on you for hiring him. He was he's apparently Correct. he's apparently done the same thing at Auburn that he did at Boise State. There hasn't been the people who are around him have said he hasn't changed. It's the same thing. Now it doesn't does it fit at Auburn? Apparently not. Does it work at Auburn? Apparently not. But you hired him. And so it's completely wrong to turn around and dive into the man's personal life in a way that that is demeaning. I don't know what's true. I don't know what's not true. I don't I don't know. And frankly, it's none of my business. But it's just you, embarrassing, man. Then you that throw, they do that. Then you throw the the racial thing out. And now you're forcing which leads to players getting on social media and going, nah, that's not him. Or other guys saying he treated us like dogs. And 
you've let this thing play out. You let it get through the weekend. It's clear what you're going to have to do. And if I'm Brian Harson, I, I say, listen, you can fire me, but I'm 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 suing yeah, you they have every that right. dime. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But you, I'm going to get every dime I'm owed, and then I'll leave. Or we can play this thing out and and it's done now the damage is done and and it's february the 7th as we record this i mean you're going to have a difficult time making the kind of hire that auburn would like to make in february you don't make this you don't do all this I, and i i don't know who the guy is i really don't i don't know who the next guy is and i know there's all kinds of rumors and names out there flowing and just about every one of them people know that i know okay let me tell everybody I do not know who the next guy is, but you don't do this unless you know who is coming in. All right, let me ask you a question. This wasn't on our our outline. Ask away. You know me and you always go off outline. So if you're Hugh Freeze, if you get offered the Auburn job December the 7th, you take it. No question about it. On February the 7th, I still think you probably take it, but now you have to really screw over a lot of people. You've got to tell a whole class of people that just signed with you that, hey, I'm, I'm bolting, as opposed to in December where you could have said, hey, this is an opportunity and I have to take it. It's more money. It's better, blah, blah, blah. I mean, I, you know, I remember I, I've told I've said this before. I remember when Alabama fired Mike Price after the whole thing in Pens- Pensacola. <laughs> and uh, one of the people that Alabama targeted was Les Miles. And Les Miles at the time was I didn't at, know that. Yeah, he was at Oklahoma State. And I talked to Les Miles several times during that process. And he finally just said, you know, in an ideal world, yeah, I'd love to be the head coach at the University of Alabama. Who wouldn't? But it's April. And I, I, I can't do that. And and ultimately he he stayed at Oklahoma State and ended up getting the LSU job a year later. But um, you know, I mean it it by doing it the way that Auburn did it. By letting it drag out. I mean, if you knew in November after the Iron Bowl that you were moving on from Brian Harson, you should have done it that Monday. To answer your question, if Hugh were to call me and ask me about it, I would literally tell him to stay put. And I've told Hugh this. Look, Hugh is a – and I know a lot of people listening are Ole Miss fans and they have their opinion on Hugh and all that stuff, right? Look, I love Hugh, man. I do. You know, right, wrong, or indifferent, I really don't give a shit what everybody else thinks about the guy. I love the guy, okay? He's been good to me, all right? True. He is a hell of a ball coach, and and he can sit right there where he's at. He can make a ton of money, and he can coach till he's tired of coaching. He doesn't have to worry about NIL. He doesn't have to worry about the transfer portal. I mean, yeah, he's in it, but it's not that big of a deal. Sure. He's going to out-recruit everybody that he's recruiting against, okay? Um, he's in a transition. I think they're fixing to go to Conference USA. That's correct. And, and they – like, there's – the amount of stress involved in a job like Auburn, I don't – if I were, I would tell, if he asked, honestly asked me, I would say I would stay right there and stay put. Okay. Um, I just, it's not, and that's the problem, right? And that's, that's, if you're, if you're hiring a guy that, that's like, I don't think you hire somebody that's got a good job. I mean, who's leaving that to go to that mess? Well, like, not a head coach and, and you're going to, you've got contracts now that you're fooling with. You just signed a class. It, it, it's, it's not a great look. Uh, it requires – it re- puts you in a bad spot. And you're, you're coming into the, the, the most difficult division of the most difficult league in the country with inheriting a roster that just went through upheaval. And uh, you've got a, clearly a booster situation that's, that's out of control in, in, in an environment where you've got to get so many things squared away. And, oh, yeah, hey, by, in about three weeks, start spring practice. I, it, yeah. It's a mess. I, I don't – I mean – Look, the money is such that someone will take it. It's a great job. It's a great program. All of those things. But Which anybody, makes me wonder, but really, is the money going to be as such if you're having to do a buyout? And you're, still then, pay, you're still paying Gus. You're still paying Gus. Well, you just gave him 20. I don't know the number. Well, you call it 20, and then you give, and then we'll round up Harson to 13. So $33 million to guys to not coach. And listen, that's before the, the staff guys. 
because you're going to have to pay off all the staff guys because you got yeah. staff guys on multiple year contracts who they're, they're getting fired without without cause. You're just firing them because they're not your football coach anymore. It, it, it's going to be an expensive proposition. It It's remarkable to me that they've allowed themselves to get to this place and to drag it out through the weekend. And um, to my knowledge, Harson's still on vacation in Mexico. I can't even, I, you know, you think about a vacation is going to be a peaceful time to kind of hang out. You go to Mexico, get some sun, get some, you know, get, catch a few waves, have a margarita or two, you know, just kind of relax. This can't be a relaxing vacation for Brian Harson. Hey, well, I, I was laughing about this last night talking to Buddy. What if he's like just sitting in Mexico drinking margaritas? It's like these guys are crazy. Like he's just like he, well, it's just like he don't even know what's going on. He's you like, me, oh, and you say, but you know, you say to your wife at some point in this, hey, look, if they fire us, we're going to leave with thirteen million dollars. It's going to be all right. Yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be we'll fine. go back to Boise. He'll get another job at some point. I mean, I don't know that this is damaged. Some of the stuff that the personal stuff that that's gotten out, whether it's true or not, it's going to stick, and he's going to have jokes told about it and stuff. And so that's going to be a problem. It's just I hope I hope I, I it would make my day if he would find out who did all that stuff and sue the shit out of him, and just just wear them out. That would make my day if he would just say whoever came up with those rumors, because you know, and I don't know this. I have been told from people inside the building um, that it was it came out from a news source that they know where it came from and i said hell i, I would sue came the, from a I, reporter came from a news source i'll tell you off the air okay because i think you know them oh interesting. Um, and so they think they've got it tracked now but i would sue i would i mean defamation i, I mean he may get out of this with a lot more than uh 12 but 12 to 13 million dollars you know I felt, I felt bad for the young woman that the the, the she was Terrible. all the pictures tweeted of her and stuff and and people make all the jokes and i don't know what's true and what's not true and and all that but man that's a person like that i mean she's that's got the family, hardest part. right i mean yeah, she's that's got the stuff. worst part of fandom okay the yeah. worst part of fandom and i've said this before you've heard me say this the worst part of fandom we went through it here at old miss i mean hell i still live in oxford okay the worst part of fandom is i signed up for it Okay, I put my name on the dotted line. I decided to do this for a career. So did Coach Harson. So they they didn't. You know what I mean? Right, like sure. the, the 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 collateral damage in some of this stuff is terrible. You know, it makes me feel terrible as a father when you know we were going through everything we're going through, and my kids are going to school, and you're hearing you know they have to listen to their friends talk about it and talk bad about your dad or talk bad you know about things that. Um, because of the fandom, you know, they get caught up in it. And I wish if I could, if I could get on the highest mountain where everybody could hear me, that's probably what I would tell everybody is just remember there are real people involved here and it's not a game to a lot of families. It's personal. Sure. And, and sometimes I get that stuff needs to be talked about and things like that, but these are real people in real lives. And again, as coaches, we signed up for it. You know, I joke all the time. I love when people troll me. I think it's hilarious. You know, I mean, if I've seen one binocular joke, I've seen them all. Um, matter of fact, I got in the first base. We had a team, new baseball team meeting yesterday. And so one of the coaches, uh, I'm, I'm over there coaching hitting. Okay, I'm a baseball guy. Another people don't know about this. Jay, I don't know if Chase knows. I'm a big baseball guy. I love baseball. And I'm over there coaching hitting. And I hear him talking to doing the parent meeting at the same time. And he introduced me as the old, the binocular guy. I was like, really? That's what, like, you've known me for for three or four years now. And that's the best we got is I'm the binocular guy. That's And, and everybody's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember that guy. And then, yeah. And so. Yeah, that's, the one I love is when they go, he's a traitor. I'm like, he was, his check was coming from Alabama. He was doing his job. Don't get me. One of these days, I'm just going to cut loose. I'm going to have enough of this shit one of these days. Yeah. And I'm just going to cut loose. <laughs> I really am. I'm just going to yeah. cut loose. I catch myself it, getting moving closer and closer to that day too, Tyler. Yeah, so I'm just going to cut loose. And 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 you know what? I think I'm going to cut loose. And I think all the old Miss people are going to go, man, you know what? He's all right. That's, what, that, that's where I'm at. I tell you, I've fallen on enough swords, okay? I should not be hated on by the old Miss people. That's all I'll say. I've fallen on a bunch of swords. I have scars all over my body from falling on swords. So I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. So, okay. But I'm just going, you know. We'll do what we got to do. I'll take my binocular jokes and just laugh about it and move on. But, uh, yeah, to me, and let's wrap this thing up on, on Harson before we get to the, mine of your favorite topic. But 
damage has been done. Um, I don't know what I don't know what the next move is. I think when he gets back from vacation, we'll have a we'll have a uh, a final deal. But it's just I, I hate it for the whole. I hate it for the whole community because it's just a bad, it's a bad deal, and there's nothing, there's nothing good going to come out of this. No, nope. and that's that's the part that sucks. Yeah. All right. So before we get out of here, because I know we're wrapping it up, I've kept you on long enough. Now, and by the way, thank you for your time because I know you love long podcasts. All right. I see. Look, you gave me a courtesy grin. Thank you. Um, the Ram- Super Bowl this weekend, Rams and Bengals. Yeah, the mighty Bengals. Me and you have a. Uh, fandom. I know you've turned into a fan, and I have too. I've jumped all over the bandwagon. Um, I like Joe Burrow, man. I, and, I do too. Um, that's, I guess, how it started. I've always liked him, even when we played against him here at Ole Miss. Um, liked him a ton. But the Rams are at minus four and a half. Okay, take off, take off your Bengal thong, and tell <laughs> me what do you think? Rams minus four and a half. Where are you going? So my concern, and I've watched every Bengals game this year. Um, most people know the story by now, those that don't. My son and I always – Carson's 15. We go to a lot of um, Major League Baseball games every every summer. And usually we go to Chicago. I'm a big Cubs fan. We go see the Cubs. Uh, a couple of years ago, we went to a Reds-Cubs series in Cincinnati because it's drivable. I like it. And Cincinnati was fun. He and I had a lot of fun in Cincinnati. And um, this year, we went back. And uh, we went back. He wanted to see Fernando Tatis Jr. and the Padres play. And so we went to a, uh, a Padres Reds series. We went to three Padres Reds games, and the Cubs were coming in right after the Padres. So we stayed an extra day and saw the first game of a Cubs Reds series. And then we drove to Nashville, went to an MLS game, and came home. It was a fun, kind of a guy's trip, right? And uh, in Cincinnati one day, we uh, we always will, like pick some random restaurant that's out someplace, and we drove out to this restaurant that's up on a bluff overlooking the city. And uh, my son plays soccer. He's a big soccer fan, loves English Premier League, all that stuff. And so we saw where uh, Cincinnati's Major League Soccer Stadium is. And then off to the left and then off to the right by the river, you saw Paul Brown Stadium where the Bengals play. And he was like, hey, you want to go check out that soccer stadium? And I was like, yeah, let's go check it out. And so we went to the soccer stadium, and it's all locked up, and nobody will let you in, COVID, crazy, and all that stuff. And um, we could barely see, you couldn't see anything, couldn't see the field, anything. And so it was kind of rainy and he was kind of not down about it, but he's a little disappointed. And I was like, Hey, you want to go see if we can see the Bengal stadium? And he's like, dad, if we can't get in here, we're not getting in there. And I said, let's just go see it. <laughs> and so we, I'm like, we're in Cincinnati. Why not? Right. And so we drive uh, over to Paul Brown stadium. We park in the parking lot near the, uh, the fan shop. And we walk over, and you can kind of see through the gate. You can see one of the goalposts, and you can see some of the, the stadium a little bit. And this gentleman in a Bengals polo is walking by. We're there. It's about 1 o'clock. And he's walking by, and for some reason, I saw, he's, he saw us, and he said, guys? And I thought he was basically saying, hey, what are you doing here, you know? Yeah. And I said, "Hey, we're just we're just looking in. We're not. I'm not. We're not. I'm not. We're not trying to cause any trouble or anything. We're just kind of looking. We're from Mississippi." And he said, "You want to see the stadium?" And I said, "Yeah, sure. That'd be great." And he goes, "Go in that building right there. Check in. Sign in. I'll be over there in a few minutes, and I'll come get you." And he comes, and he a few minutes. We sat in the lobby for a couple minutes, and he came in and got us, and he gives us a tour of the whole place. It was great. Could not have been nicer. Forty five minutes of his time. Had a great conversation all that stuff. And we got down on the 50 yard line and, you know, got to take pictures and we got up into the press box and into some of the luxury suites and all that stuff. It was really cool. And so we get in the truck uh, to, to leave the stadium to go back to the hotel and Carson goes, well, I guess we're Bengals fans now. And, <laughs> got to be. and I was like, yeah, I guess we are. And, you know, and I said, they're kind of a fun team. You know, they got Burrow and they just drafted Jamar Chase and They've got these guys, and you know, uh, Mixon, and they've got all these uh, C.J. Uzuma and, and um, you know Ty, uh, Higgins and and all those guys. It's a fun team, you know. Maybe they'll maybe they'll win a few games this year. So they're they're on their way up. And so we've watched the games this year and listened to games when we were uh, you know had some soccer tournaments where on Sunday we're driving back and um, you know we listened to the Bengals and we've it's been something we could do together. And so yeah, we've watched every play. And so I, I say all that to get to this. The concern that I've got for the Bengals is their ability up front on offense 
to handle that defensive line long enough to figure some things out. The, the thing about Burrow that I don't think he gets enough credit for because everybody gets hung up on Joe Burrow and how cool he is, and he is obviously very cool, and they get hung up on kind of how he's, you know, he's got all this charisma and stuff. I think Burrow's really smart. Yeah. Uh, Burrow, I think, sees things quickly. I think he makes adjustments quickly. I think Zach Taylor is cut from that cloth. I think they have a great relationship in that way. My concern is, can they stay in the game long enough to figure out how to attack? And, yeah, I think, and you know, because in the in the AFC Championship game, it almost got away from them because they were feeling the the Chiefs out, trying to figure out, okay, what are they doing here? And it was kind of prodding at them, and and you know, got to twenty one to three, and you're like, hey, fellas, you're kind of out of time, and they got that late touchdown that got them back in the game in the first half. You know, and they made the stop and all that. Twenty one to ten was much more. Uh, doable than 21 to three in the second half. And then, you know, Mahomes made the mistake and, you know, the rest. I'm a little concerned about that. But if they can weather the first quarter or so, I kind of like their chances. Yeah, they, so I'm going ahead and tell you, I'm taking, I'm telling everybody, the Bengals have been very good to me. Okay. Especially on this playoff run because everybody away. thinks they're going to lose every single week. And I've they seen screenshots. Yeah, you've seen screenshots. They've been good to me. All right, and so I'm riding them. I don't care. I'm riding them like Zorro. You ride them till they buck you, or you don't ride them at all. Um, obviously, the issue is the pass rush. Okay, the the and and I want to let the fans know this. What the, the interesting thing for me is, you know, they like to push the ball downfield. Okay, and when you don't have time, it's very hard to push the ball downfield. So you saw a lot of three step stuff. Okay, especially with C.J. Ushman. I can't ever pronounce his last name. Is that Ushman Zada? Is that right? I think it's Uz Uzoma. He's, He's an Auburn guy. Whatever. Yeah. He's already. I still that doesn't help. I can't pronounce it. It took me. It took me twenty five days to figure out how to pronounce Robert Kandichi. <laughs> All right. So, but the long story long story short is if he's out, going a little bit more ten personnel um, and spread them out because if it's if they're spread out, you can see it coming a little bit better. Go in some empty, but then you lose the run threat, right? And that's what they've done a really good job with. But they have to spread it out. In order to put, I think if they can spread it out and do some more ten personnel, even some empty stuff, and even if they have to reload uh, the back in the backfield or whatever it is, to where they can see what's going on, I think I would look for some of that to occur uh, in order to get them push it downfield. Because at the end of the day, I mean, I don't care who you are; they've all tried and they've all failed. Blocking Aaron Donald, you know, woo, you, and and then you got Von Miller coming off the edge. I mean, it doesn't matter how good you are; they're going to have success. Okay, yeah. they are elite pass rushers. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what offensive line you have. But I love the Bengals, but Isaiah Prince, I can just I'm having like pre nightmares about Isaiah Prince trying to block Von Miller off the edge on the right side. Like Von Miller is going to live on the defensive left side. He is because Isaiah Prince has no chance to block him. They're going to have to do some screens, some things like that to slow him down. May even trap and cut him a couple times. They have to take Von Miller out of the game. Um, even probably more so than than Aaron Donald, because what they can do with Aaron Donald is set the protection that way and double him up. They can do that. So how stubbornly, if you're the Bengals, how stubborn are you about establishing a run with with Mixon early on? I think you have to, you know. But I would like to see him do it like out of what I'm talking about, out of like you know spread sets, reload right. him in the backfield, maybe, and then you can get some miss. That's the other thing now is you know they got Jalen Ramsey, okay. But let me tell you where. LA is weak, and that's at the safety position. Okay. Jalen Ramsey is going to be on Jamar Chase. We're going to pretend like that's not going to happen. Well, they still got Higgins and they still got Boyd. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you and if you load up on if you load up on uh Higgins, then you got Boyd matched up with safeties. And that's why they're going to want to push the ball downfield because that's their matchup that they can win. If I'm a fantasy guy, I'm loading up on Taj Boyd this weekend because I think him matched up with the safeties, they have to go after that. Jamar Chase, he'll he'll get his catches, but it's not going to be. I would almost be surprised if he had a big blow up game. I think it's going to go towards more uh, the other two. And the the little quick passes out to Jamar Chase. A lot of times those turn into huge plays. He's such a right. great runner after he has the ball in his hands. And, and they're good. Better at that. And they're Listen, good. The part of the thing too is, owners. yeah, and the the Bengals, the Bengals are better on defense than they're getting credit for. They are. 
Mike Hilton's got, and I, and I'm not just saying this because I love him as a person and had him, you know, for a long time. But Mike Hilton has got to play the game of his life because he's probably going to be matched up on Cooper Cup in the slot a ton at nickel. Um, I mean, he's got a he's he did got a great job out. in the second half last week against Hill. I will tell you this: if he can cover Tyreek Hill, he'll figure out a way. You know, Cooper Cup is not a fast guy. He's just so fundamentally sound that he gets open. I mean, his first step coming out of a break is phenomenal. And that's where, if you watch Cooper Cup, it's his first step out of the break where he separates from everybody. And, you know, Mike's going to have a chance because here's the other thing now, and this is why I'm picking him. I'm picking the Bengals. Stafford, as good as he is, he will spray one from time to time. And, you know, if the Bengals can mess up and get a pick or two, and that's, you know, he struggled at that middle part of the year a little bit. Um, if he, they can mess up and, and get a turnover or two, um, you know, I like him. So, yeah. I'm going to take the the Bengals plus four and a half. May or may not even just say screw it and go money line and just just take them to win because I'm not pulling against them. So uh, that's um, me. I mean, I'm 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 going to take the Bengals and the points because I've cheered for them all year. It's the Super yeah. Bowl. They got against them. Forty million dollars under the cap to go spend in free agency. They're going to create some some more money. I I I, I hear these people that do this thing about the Bengals. They're like. Well, you know, they've been really opportunistic and it's going to catch up to them next season. I'm like, guys, they're so far ahead of schedule. Maybe they they're going to make a run. If they're they're smart in free agency. If they're smart, what I mean by smart, they need to go get him help up front. Right. They, they need to get an edge pass rusher. Yep. Okay. And I think they're solid in the middle. I love D line. I love interior D line. I love linebacker. I love safety level. Okay. They probably need to get a legit lockdown corner like a. Jalen Ramsey type, and you get an edge rusher, and they need to re retool the up front offensively, and because they got all this money saved with all the with all the young guys, so we're good there. But Neil, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I know I've kept you too long, um, but you you've always been good to me, man. And uh, literally, without question, without un, unquestioned, my favorite journalist of all time I've ever dealt with. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's not even. <laughs> That's like being the thinnest kid at fat camp, but I appreciate no, it very much. No, no, you've always been good to me, and you know, you, you were able, uh, you got it figured out. I wish, I wish all the young guys that are coming in the business were as good as you, and, and had the uh, had the credibility, I guess, to the understand how this thing works, because the world would be a much better place right now, and a lot less clicks. That's nice uh, of you but, to say. But you've always been good to me, and I thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Tyler. As always. Until next, guy, next time, guys, take care.